the Vice Chairman and Board of Governors from Dima's International Leadership Academy and the Assistant Continental Overseer in charge of research and development of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor J. A. Bolarigo. The International Overseer in charge of Corporate Social Responsibility and Pastor in charge RCCG Region 20, Pastor Ido Iriyomade. The Pastor in charge of RCCG Lagos Province 46 and Managing Director of the Bank of Industry. Pastor Kyle Lepito, the Acting Rector and of the Redeemers International Leadership Academy, Pastor Banki Ladile, and the Chairman 25th Anniversary Conference Planning Committee of the Redeemers International Leadership Academy, Pastor B. Amwana, and other members of the committee, presenters and panel discussants, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. I must thank the leadership of the Redeemers International Leadership Academy, Raila, and especially our acting rector, Pastor Banki Ladile, for the very kind invitation to me to make a few remarks at this commemorative leadership conference. I'm a proud alumnus of Raila, having graduated in the 1995 class with uh, the likes of Pastor Karabe Ito and the late uh, pioneer uh, head of Ryder, Pastor Ben Ewuzie of Pleasant Memory. I've since then served on the faculty of the institution for years. I make this historical detour because I want to establish with some authority that Ryder is not a mere Bible school. It is a school where the Bible, not in its letter, but as the revealed Word of God, is also used as an instructional manual for leadership training. Because we believe that the revealed Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and according to 1 Timothy 3.16, and I paraphrase, it is profitable for the revelation of doctrine on all matters, it is profitable for reproof, and for the correction of error in word, in thought, or in deed. So we believe that it is the best guide for leaders. But there are two crucial points to note. The first is that the leadership principles in our manual, the Bible, are often contrary. They are often contrary. And by that I mean that the principles often do not conform with our desires or, for that matter, our flesh. And we will explore this point briefly before I end my remarks. The second point is that the role of Christian leaders is central to God's plan for the world, or his plans for a nation, or a business, or even a family. This is because it is to us, and when I say us, I refer to Christians, and in particular Christian leadership, it is to us that God looks. Because according to Matthew 5, 13 and 14, again I paraphrase, we are the light of the world and we are the salt of the earth. Not the salt or light of our church or denomination or tribes or even religion, but of the whole earth. We are here to repair the damage done to different aspects of life, in business, in politics, in entertainment, navigation, as well as several other spheres of, of our lives. Now this is not meant to be an easy task, but we are faced with a formidable, even though defeated foe, who traverses the earth looking for whom to devour, doing all that is possible to steal our joy, to destroy good testimonies and developments, and to kill the destinies of men and nations. The scriptures further say that the whole earth groans as it awaits the revealing of the sons of God. We are the answer that the world is waiting for. Even for, the, even for repentance of the sins of our communities, of our nations, God expects us to do the repenting. He says, and I paraphrase again, 2 Chronicles 7 uh, verse 14, he says, it is when his people pray and repent and turn from our evil ways that we will hear the prayers of our 
communities and heal our land. It is in times of adversity or difficulty, times of hardship, that leaders are most relevant and are most needed. When all is well, there is really no need for guidance, no need for encouragement, no need for instruction. But when there are wars, conflicts, insurgencies, farming, danger and fear, is when people look to leadership. We who are instructed by the Holy Spirit through the scriptures are the leaders that these times demand, or that such times demand. So I want us to share a few nuggets from the encounter of Moses and the children of Israel as the armies of Pharaoh chased them to the Red Sea. I want us to share these nuggets because they are nuggets that show what is expected of leaders who are trained according to scripture in times of adversity. And I want us to see what happens at the moment of the greatest threat to the lives of thousands of Jews led by Moses. And this is to be found in Exodus chapter 14, verse 10 all the way to verse 17. Exodus, if we, if we just open our Bibles very quickly, so Exodus 14, and we'll read from verse 10 all the way to verse 17. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us? To bring us up out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forth. But lift up your rod, and stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So we see here the major challenge that leaders have in a crisis, especially an existential one, one that is a matter of life and death for many. The people immediately begin to complain, old and young. Look at what happened here in the scripture we just read. Old and young were complaining. Even men and women of God joined the army of complainers. So of the Jews who, who, were, who, who had just left Egypt, there were priests and wise men and women. But they joined also in saying that slavery was better than freedom. They were saying this slavery that we've just been through for 430 years is better than freedom. And they, and, and, and they also said that they had told Moses to leave them alone, to serve the Egyptians. A terrible lie. Because the Bible tells us that they cried out in anguish against the oppression of the Egyptians and that the Lord heard their cries. That is why he sent Moses to bring them out of captivity. So some interesting points here is that we are told that they in fact prayed. If you look at verse 10 of Exodus 14, Exodus 14 verse 10, we are told that they prayed. But still they grumbled after praying. They still grumbled against God. If you look at verse 11. So prayers and fasting do not prevent people from grumbling against God anyway. The second issue is that fear drives away the faith of the majority. 
But the leader cannot afford to lose his goal or his focus. He cannot afford to. He must calm himself down and calm the people down as well. He must look up to God for help. Moses looked up to God for help and God spoke to him. But I want you to note also that Moses first gave the people confidence in the power of God to deliver and fulfill his promises. He had not yet heard from God on this particular problem. But because he knew the God that he served, he was able to say with confidence in Exodus 14 verse 13, Exodus 14 verse 13, he was able to say with confidence, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more. And in verse 14 it says, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. It was only thereafter that he went and cried to the Lord for help and gave him, and God then gave him the specific instructions for the particular occasion. But I think an important instruction that God gave him was that he should tell the children of Israel to go forward. This is in verse 15 of Exodus 14, verse 15 of Exodus 14. A specific instruction they gave them is go forward. Now this is important. This instruction is very important. Because in adversity, especially where the future looks bleak, people want to give up. They want to retreat. They want to go back. They certainly don't want to go forward. And if you look at this particular situation of the children of, of Israel, the future in front of them was bleak. The future seemed like it was to meet their death inside the Red Sea. So going forward for, for the children of Israel was like saying, go and enter the Red Sea and die there. But God said, tell them to go forward. Why? Because he's the author of all things. He knows all things. Indeed, a strange thing was that he was even the one hardening the heart of Pharaoh. So God knows all things. And we must obey in faith even when we're afraid. This is the burden of leadership, especially leadership according to the principles of scripture. Now to the final point uh, on the contrarian nature of the leadership principles of scripture. I want us to take a few examples, and this is very important for leaders, because leaders, Christian leaders, very often want to sound and be like leaders in the world, or like leaders, or like secular leaders. So, but I, that's why I wanted to take a few examples of the sorts of instruction that God gives us as leaders in the faith. The scripture says, for example, that to be great, you must humble yourself. In 1 Peter 5 verse 6, 1 Peter 5 verse 6, the scripture says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, so that in due time he may exalt you. In other words, as far as the scripture is concerned, the leader must humble himself, or the person must humble himself, in order to be exalted. You do not, you do not exalt yourself in our, according to the words of Scripture. Again, let's take another example of a contrarian principle. In Matthew 5 verse 44, Matthew 5 verse 44, the Bible tells us, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, clearly, that is not the sort of thing that any one of us wants to hear. That's not the sort of thing that secular leadership is made of. But this is the sort of thing that leadership in the faith calls for. Leadership of men and women who are children of God. That's what it calls for. In Matthew 10 verse 16, the scripture again says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now clearly, being wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove is hardly the sort of thing that seems reasonable. But that is the very nature of the principles of scripture. They may not make sense to us. But these are the principles that we're required to follow because the source of this wisdom is the almighty, all-knowing, all-wise God himself. We must know, as scripture says, that even in what appears to be his foolishness, he is still vastly wiser than us. 
which is why the leadership model of Christ is contrary. It is the opposite of what our flesh wants or agrees with. But these are the winning principles, not just in times of adversity, but at all times. So let me again congratulate the Board of Governors and the leadership of Ryla on our 25th anniversary. And I pray that as our days, so shall our strength be in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless Ryder.